thank you very much for joining this morning's session. Uh, I would like to share with you some practices that uh, were normally practiced over the recent and also perhaps the past uh, Lunar New Year, or we call it the Chinese New Year, and um, how some of these practices uh, are closely related to Buddhism. Or in another way you can look at it is that how you can... Um, add more Buddhist values into your practices over the Lunar New Year. So let me share, let me start the uh, presentation right now. But before I go into the uh, Chinese New Year proper, let me, perhaps it's, it is good that we look back, yeah? What make, made up Chinese culture? Because right now we see so many kinds of uh, input, some Buddhistic, some not Buddhistic. Uh, and what actually uh, sort of like... Uh, make Chinese culture very unique, okay? Now, we must remember that Chinese culture is one of the oldest civilization in the world with a, a long history, about 3,500 years, yeah? Uh, Mesopotamian, uh, Indian, uh, we are almost there, yeah? The, the Chinese, uh, the, uh, what call it, culture developed uh, along the lines of um, Mesopotamian and Indian culture. So, very long history. Then, we must also remember that uh, along these 3,500 years, there are many, uh, we call it, influences that came in and made Chinese culture very, very rich. And if you look at all the cultures, uh, all the religious uh, aspect of the Chinese culture, you notice there is a blend, um, you know, a roja, you know, form of uh, Chinese culture which, which comprises of Buddhism, Taoism, uh, Confucianism, uh, and also some Chinese folklore, yeah? Somewhere, uh, some practices that we cannot even put it into either Buddhism, Taoism, or Confucianism. So, um, so it is a, a, a sort of like a very, um, uh, we can say, um, a harmonious sort of a relationship between these three religions. And uh, the Chinese has made it so harmonious that, you know, it looks like as though it is one, yeah? But in those days, when we bring in all this culture, it was like uh, absorbed in, and then, uh, you know, it was made it, they made it so, so smooth uh, that people don't really think that, you know, they are all separated, but rather one. So that's why you notice today, we have lots and lots of uh, different practices, but it is important for us to understand uh, which of these practices are closely related to Buddhism, yeah? And Buddhism was kind of recently only re introduced into China and also into Chinese culture. Uh, it is at the turn of the, um, uh, after the birth of Christ. That's only about 200 years after the birth of Christ, yeah? So not very much, uh, not so old, about 1,800 years old only, as compared to Confucianism, which is like additional... 800 years, yeah? So, so it looks like um, some practices, like for example, Confucianism and Taoism were strongly rooted by the time Buddhism came. And uh, when Buddhism was first introduced into China, they faced a lot of challenges. So now, the Buddhists who are practicing Buddhism um, cleverly, or we call it skillfully, um, uh, not say created, but um, absorb some of these ideas and um, introduce Buddhist ideas into the Chinese culture. Yeah, uh, we will take a look at some of these um, sort of like challenge uh, responses. Yeah, to the challenges uh, given by the Taoists and the Confucians. All right, we must understand that Chinese culture um, and uh, festivals are based on the lunar solar calendar. Now, what's a lunar solar calendar? It is basically a combination of a uh, festival that revolve along the sun and the moon calendar. Yeah. So the sun calendar is like January, February, March, April. Yeah. But what about the lunar calendar? The lunar calendar is based on the moon movement. So every month we have a full, a full moon rotation is about 28 to 29 days. So we split into... Uh, 12 months, you have about uh, 12, uh, sorry, 24 segments. That means each month has two sort of um, seasons, yeah? And that's why you have the 24 season drums, yeah? Because each drum reflects 
one sub season. So we just celebrated, uh, uh, what you call it, the arrival of spring, and then now we are already in the spring season. Okay, uh, we have the Lichun on uh, during Lunar New Year, and uh, today we are probably in the season of Yusui. That means uh, Yusui. That means in the in the season of the rain water. So it's, it is showing that the spring is coming back, the rain is coming back, and very soon um, animals will awake from slumber. So this is based on the Chinese calendar. But how does that impact us? So um, our Chinese culture is based on this calendar and the changing of season. And therefore, when we celebrate festivals, it is like a reflection of what's happening at a point of time. Yeah. And uh, for example, um, spring, what is associated with spring? It's like cherry blossoms, yeah, plum blossoms. So you notice that when we celebrate New Year, you have all the cherry blossoms. So we, we really some objects back to the festival. Then we must also remember, yeah, um, when you organize festival, basically it is a time when people gather and to remember something that has happened at that point of time, either, uh, either an event or either um, to celebrate. Yeah. So you had, that is why sometimes we have, we call it the harvest festival, because at the end of harvest, we have good uh, crop. Uh, therefore, we celebrate. Okay. And then um, if we believe in, let's say, the spirits of um, the, the sun, the moon, the rain, then we say thank you very much to all of them for giving us good weather. Yeah, and then for example, during Chinese New Year, we have the Pai Teng Kong. So for the Hokkien's, that's very very important because we believe that many many uh, hundred years ago we were saved. Yeah, um, be uh, because we were attacked by uh, by enemies and we hide ourselves in bamboo grove, in sorry in sugar cane grove, and that's for and therefore we were saved and that's why we say thank you very much for the second gift of life. So some festivals relate back to uh, events of gratitude or celebration. Then for us as practitioners, we must understand, yeah, whatever we do, we must always ask ourselves, why do we do this? Yeah? What is the meaning of all these practices? And when you understand all this meaning, then your practices will be more, uh, we call it, we can relate better. Yeah? And it makes the whole thing more meaningful. And when you practice, you can be very, very confident that you, you are practicing something that can help you to improve yourself further. Now, the Chinese culture is based on this aspect, this virtue. We call it filial piety. And if you notice why your parents say you must listen to your parents and um, you know um, take advice from your parents, because the family is the core element in our Chinese culture. Yeah. So that is why <clears throat> our culture is unique from the West, because in the West, everybody is very individual, whereas the Chinese culture focuses on the family. Okay, this is a board that is placed above ancestral altar. It's called Chui Yan, yeah, looking at the past or chasing the past, yeah, or look very far, uh, uh, very far. And when you talk about very far, we talk about looking far to the back. And this is where it was extracted, yeah, from the analect in, um, as part of the Confucian practice, yeah. So it is a reminder to all descendants, yeah, <clears throat> that when our ancestors pass away, they must always be remembered, yeah. Remembered for the sacrifices, Remembered for all the work they have done because what they what they have done is that they have given you an opportunity to grow and to be what you are today. Yeah. So this is a very important aspect when you remember your ancestors, and therefore this plaque, these two words were always placed above ancestor altar. And in Chinese culture, we always stress a lot on decorum. That means having proper instructions or SOP in place. And when you offer materials, in this case, you always must remember as though 
they are around or that means you are serving them as though they are alive and in front of you yeah so you must pay respect yeah offer things with respect so and when we offer things yeah especially in chinese culture always remember yeah there are always meaning behind what we offer yeah it is either based on homonyms homonym means same sound yeah different chinese character but having almost the same sound yeah so it's a, it is a representation of a good virtue or otherwise it can be according to the shape of the offering for example anku those those red cakes that has the shape of a tortoise and you know that tortoise represents long life so when you offer anku on the table people understand that it is a gift representing long life so we when we place this on the altar or when we present this to people we hope that they too will receive those blessings yeah as per uh, indicated on the objects given let's look at how buddhism look at symbols yeah so just now we had offerings of lights incense flowers yeah and each of these object has got a meaning for example lights wisdom incense the virtue of the dharma you know the the smell of the incense can be you can smell it anyway even though you you go against the wind because it is it it pervades everywhere so the dharma is like that yeah you can smell it everywhere it is fragrant and then flowers impermanence and we all know about lotus which is a symbol of purity and we talk about red red in buddhism is it indicates blessings so you get blessings when you practice so similarly when you come to chinese culture when you offer pray uh, offerings on the table you have some of these uh, materials that um, are commonly seen on the altar table yeah for example apple um and in malaysia most of these fruits are based on same sound yeah uh, either in mandarin or in hokkien or sometimes cantonese so like apples we call it pengko so it represents the word ping an ping an yeah so mm -hmm. likewise we all talk about pineapple ong lai so in chinese you see it has different meaning yeah but in hokkien it means ong you know good luck coming so we all must understand that you know that hopefully when we place this fruits on the altar we we can receive or it represents effort for us to make when we want to receive these blessings yeah because having just to put fruits on the altar and not making any effort you know it comes to not it comes to zero yeah so we must make effort but when we offer we tell ourselves we are making an effort now to achieve these blessings to receive these blessings yeah so sugar cane yeah very important during pai tikong kamchia so and then it, it reflects on the word kamsia thank you yeah kamchia is sugar cane but it sounds like thank you and let's look at cakes this time mentioned about angku kueh so because of the shape of the kueh which is tortoise so it represents longevity antan is this round ones yeah this round uh, angku kueh uh, in in my culture in baba nyonya it means go and the long one we call it pt because on the top it looks like join coins yeah like coins arranged in a row and in those days in the malay culture pt you know you need when you buy certain things you need to break the coins from this long chain and that's why we call it pt and in reference to that it is uh, a symbol of silver in my community yeah and then we eat tang yuan queen e it's a symbol of unity of positive of of uh of uh we call it harmony we have the red we have the white and sometimes we have multicolored ones yeah so it's a symbol of unity of people coming together in a very sweet condition because we serve tang yuan normally in syrup yeah and then we have the fakao and what about food so in chinese you see when we serve food especially during the reunion dinner we have fish because we want it to have the symbol of we want it to sound like there's a lot of food available for the year yeah and then you have fat choy those those um 
uh, ingredient that looks like hair, yeah, but it sounds like fat chai, that means um, prosperity coming, yeah. So all these things, yeah, when we offer or when we place on the table during reunion dinner, it represents a very important meaning of good blessings, of unity, of joy, yeah. So that what makes celebration more joyous. So this is Tang Yun, okay, the red and white in syrup water. And this is vermicelli, or we call it Mian Sien, Mi Sua, yeah, um, symbol of long life. <coughs> and because this is white, we normally put a dash of red so that, you know, it, it doesn't look, because white is a symbol of mourning, yeah, uh, someone who passed away, they wear white or black. So we have put the dash of red so that it shows that it is a joyous occasion and a sweet taste, a sweet uh, moment of it, yeah, which is with this rock sugar. And then during Chinese New Year too, before we start a joyous celebration, uh, it is a common practice amongst the Chinese that we must remember our old, uh, ancestors. And therefore, normally the day before or at least two days before uh, our celebration like New Year or Qingming or seven months, we will remember our ancestors. And with that, a lavish spread of food would be placed onto the altar and then offered to our ancestors. So we treat them as though they come back home and joining us for the reunion dinner, yeah, for during New Year. And therefore, they are served first because they are the most senior people in our family, yeah. And you notice everything is arranged in decorum. In uh, you know, it's it's like you treat them as though they are the main guests for the day, yeah, the biggest guests, the the the, the grandest uh, guests for the day, and therefore you give them the choicest, the most important part of the, the, the meat or the vegetable for them to eat, yeah? And then thereafter, the food that we serve on the altar will be taken by the family members during the reunion meal. And if you look at the Chinese word, yeah, for reunion meal, especially in Hokkien, <coughs> we call it we law, um, is that we gather around the hearth Okay, uh, it, we law means together to, to group together around a hot pot, yeah, or a hot stove. And the, on the hot stove, we serve something hot. So the family will sit down, cuddle together, having the meal from one stove. So that reflects the reunion of the family member. And we law normally happens during cold season, yeah. So, and Luna New Year falls towards the end of winter, where it is cold. So people huddle together for a meal. So it is a time of uh, happiness, reunion. We get to meet people, especially your old folks, your grandparents, especially, yeah? So that's why reunion meal is very, very important. It is a symbol, like in Buddhism too, we stress a lot on family. So um, if we take care of family, the family is joyous, we would have a peaceful life. Then at the same time too, on the new year, uh, first day of new year, the morning, we would pay respect to our elders. And as we pay respect to our elders, we, we actually wish them well. Yeah, and we'll take a look at all the wishes afterwards. Now, look at the Buddhist aspect of uh, paying respect to elders and taking care of elders. Yeah, let's start off with the Maha Mangala Sutta. Yeah, we talk about the support of, <coughs> of father and mother, yeah, and the, you know, and taking care and the cherishing of wife and children. So we talk about family here. We talk about the seniors and the juniors, and we take care of all these people. And when we talk about father and mother, that's not only the parents, yeah, but we also talk people beyond that, uh, grandparents as well. So <coughs> having taken care of them and having taken care of your family members. And when you have peaceful family and a good relationship, your family will be strong. Your family will be happy. And that would be the basis for you when you go out and work and meet people that you have a peace of mind. Yeah. So that's why the Buddha said it is the highest blessing. And then let's look at Sigala Vada Sutta. Now Sigala, the young boy, pays homage to all the, the six directions. Yeah. Um, 
And in uh, Buddha, the Lord Buddha mentioned in particular that he also, he also pays respect to the east where the sun rises. And we talk about the sun, the sun represents your elders. Okay. So now while the boy is doing this ritually, we talk about the meaning behind that ritual. It talks about the relationship and the responsibilities between a child to the parent and a parent to the child. Yeah. So as parents, they want their children to be good, yeah, uh, to be skillful. That means they want you to learn a lot of traits, a lot of um, uh, experiences so that you can be a more all-rounded person. And then to look into your well-being yeah, by arranging marriage or seeing to your marriage and also to make sure that whatever inheritance they have, whether it's tangible, non-tangible, whether it's like in terms of the property, house, or even in knowledge, are being transferred to the to you all yeah but as for children your responsibilities to parents include you must always remember to support them support them not only like giving nanny every month but also to give them emotional support as well yeah to make them happy and then you must also fulfill your duties as children yeah by being obedient to them and your part is to also honor traditions that means if you are chinese you must always remember that uh, you are Chinese, yeah? And therefore, you have certain traditions that your family observe, especially like New Year, you will continue them. But continue, please make sure that you understand what is the practices like, yeah? And you, re when you receive their inheritance, you take care of this inheritance and make them grow, yeah? And then when they pass away, you will remember them. So that's why... It is very important for you as children to remember the sacrifices of your elders and parents. Then look at Pai Tien Kong. This is a very important ceremony, especially for the Hokkien's on the eighth day of Lunar New Year, because it reflects um, the, um, the, how the Hokkien's were saved from enemies on this particular day. They, they hid themselves in sugarcane uh, plantation, and then, they, and then when the enemies couldn't find them, and then when they left, they all emerged safely on this day. And therefore, they give thanks to heaven for being saved. Yeah? And that's why the Hokkien's treat this as though it is even, even more grand than uh, Chinese New Year. Yeah? This is why they call it the Hokkien New Year. But who do they pray to? They pray to Tian Kong, or in Buddhism, Lord Sakra. So... According to the Taoist uh, aspect of Teng Kong, it is like he is the creator. I mean, he is like the, 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 the main god, yeah? the king of gods. Yeah? So, and he checks on you. That means the kitchen god. That's why the kitchen god goes up to heaven to report to him. Yeah? So he is like the all-knowing person who knows what, has happening, what is happening in your family. Yeah? So he has the help of many little, little gods. Yeah? Uh, and therefore, like the kitchen god reports to him, and he has three also officials to see, to oversee the um, uh, what I call it, what the human did in the world. Okay, that's the Taoist aspect. Let's look at the Buddhist aspect. Yeah, now the Buddhists treated Teng Kong as Sakra or the king of gods at the thirty-three heaven, uh, the gods um, heaven of the thirty-three gods. Yeah, Tawatimsa is Two planes, two worlds above earth, yeah? Above earth, the first one would be Chatu Maharajika or the heaven of the four kings, yeah? We'll take a look at the four kings afterwards. And following that, above that, is Tawatimsa heaven. That's where Sakra resides, yeah? Now, according to the, the uh, mythology, it is, based, it, is a it is a heaven on top of Mount Sumeru, yeah? And likewise, like, like the Taoist tradition, Sakra is also the head of gods, yeah? And there are many stories when, whenever his seat gets hot and hot, it is a symbol that, it is a sign that someone on earth needs help and he will come to your aid, yeah? Now, um, Brahma, sorry. Now, Brahma is also a kind of um, uh, uh, being, but it is a very high being because their minds have already been developed, yeah? And you can only develop this uh, condition when you meditate. And when you meditate deeply, 
And then when you pass away, you may achieve this stage, the stage of the Brahma world. Yeah. But otherwise, like Sakra, it is also like human. We also are subject to birth and death. Like the Brahma too, yeah. Brahma too is subject to birth and death because we are not perfect yet. So why is Sakra very important? Because the Sakra, um, before becoming the king of gods, he made these seven vows, yeah? And in, in the Buddhist text, yeah, um, it is clearly stated that <clears throat> this, with these seven uh, virtues or vows that he, he, he has uh, uh, practiced, he continues to be Sakra, yeah? And look, number the first two tells you clearly the importance of of keeping um, of taking care of your family yeah as long as i live i will support my parents as long as i live i respect family elders you see so family is very important and that's why sakra comes to help to your aid whenever you have problem especially when when you have challenges in your life yeah so if you practice these seven vows you can be Lord Sakra, you can be the king of heaven, yeah? So these are the four heavenly kings of the Chatu Maharajika. This is the, in Mandarin they call it the Si Tawang, okay? Si Tian Tawang, yeah? So they are the kings of the four quarters of the north, south, east, and west. And they got, uh, and they with their retinue of um, beings uh, protect Buddhism, okay, and they are and they reside in the world of the four kings, yeah, the Chatu Maharajika uh, realm. Now, why do I put this picture up? Because <clears throat> sometimes in my practice as a Buddhist, yeah, even though uh, I do practice Chinese culture very much, I try to imbue a little bit of Buddhist um, practices or Buddhist ideas into my practices, yeah. And I would place this on the candles as part of the decoration during Pai Teng Gong. Okay, this is how my Pai Teng Gong altar looks like. You notice this, it, this little figurine here, one, two, three, and four. Those are the four deities, the four king of heaven. I place on the candle and you notice this table is lower than the above table. This higher table is for Teng Gong or Lord Sakra, and there's no meat on top, all fruits and flowers. Down here is the lower altar, which reflects one plane lower, yeah? That is uh, where the king of the four quarters or the king, uh, four kings reside, the four heavenly kings reside, yeah? And then the ground, the ground is earth. That's where we human beings live, yeah? So you can see that sometimes um, you can imbue you can add on Buddhist practices or ideas into your practices. Yeah. And um, as for prayers, like in this case, I do not um, offer sacrifices. Yeah. What you see on this table are basically vegetarian stuff, fruits, vegetables, cakes. Yeah. And they are all non, they are all uh, non meat materials. Yeah. So I try to, to imbue these practices in my lives. Yeah. Even though I, I do still carry on some Chinese uh, culture like burning gold paper and everything, but I always tell myself, uh, you must understand the underlying meaning, yeah? And, you know, I don't burn thousands and thousands of papers anymore. I just burn, we call it yisi, because it's just like sharat, you know, we call it in our language, sharat or yisi. That means it's just a cursory one, yeah? Just a minimal amount, um, because I think it is part of this whole setup, yeah? Uh, of prayer, it, it relates back to my childhood days and I feel comfortable about it. But if you are not comfortable with all this, you may let it go, yeah? And then uh, you can uh, imbue your own form of practices with Buddhist touches in your practices. So on New Year Day, we wish everyone, yeah, uh, well and happy. Now, the Buddhist Greeting is, may you be well and happy. Sabe sata, suki hotu, yeah? May all beings be well and happy. But look at the Chinese greetings, yeah? During New Year, you have kung si fa chai. Okay, we talk about wishing you uh, being prosperous and uh, happy. And then we have this sen ti cheng kang, your, may you be healthy, yeah? 
and then Nian Nian Yu lots of uh, extras for the years, yeah. One Shi Rui, all your wishes come true. Tachi Tali. Tali. And then that means basically I want you to have got uh, to have lots of good luck, profits, and then yes, for Kausen, for every step there's promotion and everything. Yeah. So we wish everyone um, well. And in Chinese culture, it is not wrong for you to be rich or prosperous. Yeah. If uh, you achieve uh, richness and prosperity through the right means, yes, you people will be joyous. People will, will celebrate with you. And therefore, that's why we wish you uh, being prosperous because by being, um, when you have money, you can help other people. Yeah. Not only help yourself, but you can help other people to be better. Yeah. And that's why we wish everyone good. Uh, may they be well, may they be happy, and may they be prosperous. Yes, and according to the Maha Mangala Sutta, we talk about skills, yeah? That's why the Buddha said, you must have lots, you must read a lot, yeah? Read a lot and learn a lot of things, and you must perfect your handicraft. That means perfect the skill. For example, you are a doctor, you are a very good doctor, okay? You are an eye doctor, you know the eyes very well, you, you treat your patients well, and people will come to you, yeah? Highly trained discipline, okay? Do your job well. And importantly, when you become some, somebody up there, always remember to speak pleasantly to the people around you. Because when you speak nicely, people will listen to you. People will not, you know, why la, you talk so rough, you know, that sort of thing, yeah? So you speak to them uh, pleasantly and people will be happy and people will come to you. So that is why the Buddha said, being good in your job, in your work, being skilled, yeah, is an important blessing. And therefore, the Buddha wants you to do that. So I hope that having listened to all that, that um, this new year of the tiger, will make you uh, a better person. Uh, may lots of prosperity come your way. May you be well and happy always. Yeah, and always keep safe. Yeah, now with the COVID around and the numbers increasing, uh, we should be smart. We should be wise to keep ourselves safe. Yeah, safe from all this uh, trouble and pandemic. So I wish you all, all the best. Um, and do remember, um, Family is the most important factor in our Buddhist and also uh, Chinese culture. And remember that we must respect their elders and always continue to support them. Um, let me quickly take you around uh, my house, yeah? What I do during New Year or what I have in my house. So I'm going to have two minutes walk into my house. That's how my house looks like from outside. Welcome to my home. Welcome, okay? So it looks like this. Brightly decorated in red and uh, colorful, color and multicolors for my new year. And the red Ang Chai, this red banner welcomes all of you and welcome to indicate to you that my family is happy and safe. So this is the first hall uh, where I welcome all my guests. Yeah, nicely decorated to to make you feel comfortable and happy. Red, red, yeah, Ang Ang. And on my altar, I have lots of symbols here. The symbol of may the year be plentiful with the rice here and flour and uh, uh, spring onion. And then this is my salad leaf I dip in water. And then the center part is the nian kao and the fakao. So, and then there's a sweet meat here on this box that I offer to Lord Buddha and Kuan Yin, wishing that the, may the whole year be sweet and uh, filled with happiness. This is the second hall. This is my ancestral altar hall, where I remember my ancestors during um, every day and also during um, main festivals, we have food offered here. And this is what I offered this year, just before Chinese New Year. The same food that I eat uh, during reunion meal, yeah? And all these special Chinese New Year kuehs, yeah? I don't serve cakes, but Chinese New Year kuehs. 
this is my inner hall where I my where all my friends and guests would sit down and where I relax and where I am sitting right now. So this is the cupboard that you see behind me. So this is how the whole setup is like. Yeah, uh, very warm, very welcoming. And this is what I serve on the table when my guests come. I have sweets here, sweet meats, because according to the past in the ancient Chinese, people, family members travel far. They take many hours, many days to come to your place. And when they're hungry, the first thing they would eat is something very, very sweet. Yeah. So that's why sweet meats are always served during Chinese New Year. Then only we go to all the wonderful quays around the sweet meat box. Yeah. So... I have, okay, not too bad. Reasonable amount of ways to serve my friends. And with that, I want to wish every one of you long life, uh, prosperity, and may you all continue to be well and happy. Thank you.